You have to let me know plenty of time for a new training to make it to the next week. Following week, it's a whole new topic. Large group training tonight. You also have to give me plenty of notice if you have a conflict. Can I make it? The assignments are on the blackboard. You had several emails this week. Where is the makeup session? Where do I find it? What do I do? If you log in the blackboard and you see the UGS 018. session during the same week because that's what we're going to be discussing in the small group training. So if you don't watch the video, you're going to be lost in the small group training. The journal entry to remove the absence for this large group training is due the following Monday by 5 p.m. So at least watch the video during the same week prior to your small group training and then get the journal entry completed by the following Monday to account for your absence if you cannot attend if you want to do another analysis. Register your iClicker 2. We've already had a few people saying they forgot it today. You must bring it to this training. If you haven't purchased one yet, you're already three weeks into the semester. You must purchase one immediately. If you haven't registered it, go to iClicker.com. A couple of simple steps to get it registered. The instructions, there's little pictures on there of how to do it. It's very easy. Got to load our roster and show several students who not have it registered yet. I know we talked about community oh, service. We went to the fair hopefully last week. We talked about your small group training as well. Um, what you, we're going to train you on how to use Hornslink. If you're already performing service hours, which I know some, some of you are, please keep a log of the name, the event, the sponsoring organization, the hours spent, and someone we can verify with with your phone number or contact information. Since our PowerPoint's not working, I'm going to ask you a question that's either yes or no. On your right, try clickers ready. All right, go ahead and ask the question. Yes, have you ever had stage fright? Or B, no. Not C, D, or E. Come on now. A or B. We'll give it a few more seconds. All right, that's good right there. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and take the time to introduce um, Dr. John Daly. He has a list of accomplishments that uh, would be too difficult to commit to memory. So if you bear with me, I want to do, introduce him to tell you a little bit about what he's done. He graduated from Purdue University with his PhD and is the Little Centennial Professor of Communication, a University Distinguished Teaching Professor, the TCB Professor of Management, and an Adjunct Professor for Pharmacy. He has published more than 100 articles and chapters in scholarly publications and completed six books. Dr. Daly's interests focus on practical ways of improving the communication skills of individuals. Thus, he has examined topics such as shyness, personality differences in communication, communication difficulties, people experience in their personal and professional lives, and ways people advocate for their ideas. In recent years, he has worked with the White House on issues related to customer service and communication. Dr. Daly has been the winner of every campus-wide undergraduate teaching award UT has to offer. Suffice it to say, he knows his stuff. So I expect everyone to be taking notes with your notebooks open and give a warm welcome to Dr. John Daly. I teach a couple classes. One is actually in this room. It's called interpersonal communication. Think about that. Room of 500 people, interpersonal. The other course I teach is actually in Washington, D.C. 
UEC, the University of Edison program called the Archer Program, where people can spend a semester doing an internship at the White House and Capitol Hill, and they actually can make 15 hours of credit at the same time at UT. Oddly enough, it's cheaper to do an internship in DC and get 15 hours than to be on campus here. So I fly out there about four times a semester to teach one of the classes. Uh, those are the two undergraduate classes I teach. I was asked tonight to talk about presentations. Um, how many of you, how many of you made a presentation before in your life? You know, you don't do many of them, but the ones you do are incredibly consequential, right? In other words, if you stand in front of 500 people and you blow it, it's a lot worse than if you blow it with just one person. Now, most of us are not going to stand up in front of 500 people very often. But when you do, it really does matter. We've done a lot of research on what it takes to be a good presenter. Given the time I have, about 15, 20 minutes at most, I'm going to give you five or six things you might want to think about to be a better presenter. Number one, most importantly, have a point. Have something to say. You've got to be able to simply say, what I want people to remember is this. Have a point. You know, this sounds odd from a professor, but I actually love billboards. You're driving to Houston on I-10. You're going 80 miles an hour. You're talking to your friends. The radio is on. You drive by one billboard, one picture, no more than seven words, and you know exactly what that billboard wants you to do. It's extraordinary when you think about it. How many know what a Bucky's ad looks like automatically? They're not even any words. You just know what it means. You see the beaver, you know what's going to happen, right? It's unbelievable. Chick-fil-A requires a little bit more mental effort. But once you figure out everything's a joke about beef on Chick-fil-A ads, it gets easy, doesn't it? Good speakers, good communicators always have a point. So the next time you've got to make a presentation, do me a billboard. I'm going to say one picture, no more than seven words, show that billboard to five people, see if each of them says, oh, I know what you're talking about. I know what I want people to remember from this. First thing, have a point. Second thing, show people there's something in it for them. Show people there's something in it for them. I teach a course in advocacy or influence at the MBA level at UT. How do you persuade people? It's a very simple rule. Always answer what we call the with it question. With it stands for what's in it for them. Not what's in it for you, but what's in it for them. If you want to be particularly effective communicating your ideas, find a way of making it relevant to other people. Look, a couple observations. Number one, your with it is probably not going to be their with it. When you were little kids, if you like Skittles, and it was your mother's birthday, what did you end up buying your mother? Skittles. How many of you figured out by this point in your life, your mother might not actually like Skittles? <laughs> How many of your moms that like really weird kind of things, like chocolate covered cherries or something like that? It's disgusting. <laughs> How many of you understand, you have to on her birthday get her what she likes, know what you like, right? The ability, to, if you know, there's somebody who always asks me, I study I research we work on with really successful people. What makes people sometimes particularly successful leaders? I've interviewed probably a thousand people who have been incredibly successful leaders. And one thing they all tell you is this. You've got to be able to read people if you want to be effective. You've got to be able to read what their turn-ons are and what their turn-offs are. If you can't read people well, you're not going to be an effective leader. That's straightening up their weapon. So, different people in the audience may have very different weapons. For one person, is that you'll learn a lot in this class. For another person, you'll simply be done quickly. For a third person, you'll get rich listening to this. For a fourth person, you'll have status by listening to this. Good communicators have this incredible capacity in a room to address everyone's weapon almost individually. The ability to read what matters to other people and build your presentation around it is a crucial thing. Third thing you've got to do, you've got to become a storyteller. You've got to become a storyteller. Who's had some great teachers in your life? Who's had a great boss in a job before? Who goes to religious services sometimes? A good pastor, priest, minister, rabbi, and then a great teacher, a great leader, they have one thing in common. Every one of them knows how to tell stories. Why? We are our stories. All of you have families. What is a family? 
A family is neither biological nor geographic. A family is indeed a collection of stories. Have you ever thought about this? When you have kids someday, your inheritance, I don't care how wealthy you become, will in fact be some stories. Who does family reunions here? Who does family reunions here? There's storytelling sessions. Half the stories are even true, but over six generations they became true. Who has that story about that weird great uncle who squandered this family's fortune? That character to work today. There's no truth to it, it doesn't matter as long as everyone believes it. Who has a much older or younger brother or sister? How far apart? 19 years. 19 years. Amos brother 19. Going, going. How far, sir? Uh, 27. 27. You will expect that. Older or younger? Oh, that's your older, right? Brother or sister? Brother. Brother. Is he a brother or like a second father, a cousin, a weird uncle? Oh, father. Yeah, why? The biology at least is half the same. The geography may be identical. The difference is the stories. By the time you're old enough to go on vacation to Disney, he had no desire to go. Hell, he maybe babysat your uncle when you think about it, right? Understand, he couldn't even fit in the teacups. You have a difference of stories. He remembers your father having energy, you have no recall of that. You go, Dad, what's with you? Yeah, he came home, I leave him and rode on the run for an hour. He said, damn, when I was a kid, he's just sat in his lazy boy, he uses remote. And your brother comes back and says, I was the remote in my day. <laughs> I'm going to stay on block, maybe similar biology, similar geography, the difference in stories. You don't share stories in common. Who has a close to eight sibling? Who has a brother sister close to eight? You can talk about so much more. You knew the same teachers. You knew the same families. You both remember when your dad went nuts one day in the car. You have no memory of that stuff. The reality is stories define families. But from a persuasion presentation skill thing, Every great teacher tells stories. Who's had a good history class? Stories. Who's had a god one? Dates and names. How many think I'm right about that? In fact, if you think of every class you've had at UT, check me out, the best tell stories. Why? Not only are stories, but we think narratively. We learn every value you have by the stories you hear. Who remembers your fairy tales as a child? Name one of them. What was your favorite fairy tale? Cinderella. Absolutely. I've, that's why Nordstrom's exist. What's another fairy tale? Yes. Okay, very good. What's another one? Every movie you go to, every novel you read has exactly that structure. 
setting, characters, goals, obstacles, resolution, and sometimes lessons learned. And that's true in every one of the world. What does it take to tell a good story? Number one, as we said before, a story has to have a point. How many know people tell stories that you cannot figure out what the point of the story is? It's a joke out of punchlines. Number two, it's got to be told quickly. How many know people tell stories but they go on too long? Okay, who's been sober around a group of drunk people? <laughs> There's no point and they go on relentlessly, right? <laughs> Number three, you've got to be able to identify with the story. So any of you have kids here, none of you have kids, right? When somebody tells you stories about their kids, you act like you care. You really don't. <laughs> You're not supposed to understand it. How many of you other students, if you tell your parents something really funny happened on campus, they go, What's funny about that? That's sad. There's no problem to have to be there. They can't identify. They don't get the story because the point isn't one that makes sense to them. Stories have to reflect values. Here's a question. How do you find good stories? There are a lot of different ways. One way is similar to think of any values you have. Who believes in honesty, for example? Either A, because you are a pathological liar in high school and needs to be considered. Or B, you want some honesty or dishonesty happen. There's the story right there. When did you learn that honesty mattered? If you believe loyalty matters, it's probably because you saw somebody being disloyal or loyal. If you believe achievement matters, it's because you saw somebody work extra hard and become more successful. You say, how do people always seem to find the right story? They find the right story because they, I deeply value this, or I deeply value that. Why do I know that value be true? Stories have to be well told, too. You've got to kind of act the story out in some ways. You've got to use different voices for different characters. Use gestures to make people see it. Stories have to also have some degree of personal relevance to you. Noise and values so you can think of the way things have changed, for example. How many of you know you're different people today than you were five years ago? Something happened. Good or bad to change you, right? How many of you had some moments you left with some of a simply different person? If you say I can't tell stories, what do you do? One simple thing, start using the phrase for example. Anytime you say for example, what are you forced to do? Come up with a story. Now, some of you said, I really can't tell stories. Look, I'm majoring in computer science. I have no personality. <laughs> <laughs> what do I know if I can't tell stories? Collect like interesting factoids other people don't know. Little factoids have the same impact as stories. You take a tour of a museum. You take a tour of a park. What do you remember? One or two interesting stories and one or two little facts. I want all of you to understand something. We do these leadership studies. One thing we know about very successful people that impress other people is they always know details that surprise people. When somebody says, how do you know that about our company? How do you know that about our university? How do you know that detail? Your credibility goes up automatically. So we know the same thing as we tell stories. If you can't tell a story, go on an interesting fact. And people go, that's so interesting, I didn't know that. I have a friend, I do some work with her. She's actually a physician, actually no longer a physician. She stepped out, no, doesn't practice anymore. She manages hospitals. I asked her one time, I help her with chain, it's a chain of hospitals in California. I asked her one time, why don't you use a big consulting firm? Why do you use people like faculty members instead? She says, John, what did I do before I became a hospital administrator? I said, you're a doctor, what kind of, a surgeon. She says, what kind of surgeon? You were a plastic surgeon. She says, yes, I was, and what did I do? I said, you work with burn patients. She actually trained in San Antonio for her. She especially was grafting skin after people got burned. Said, so what's that do? Why use professors for change as opposed to consulting for her? Says, John, you know, if you take a piece of skin off your leg and plant your arm, it will take about 95% of the cases. It will go right back again. If I take a piece of skin off his leg and put it in your arm, it will get rejected about 95% of the time. The body has natural antibodies to anything that's not its own. Even if it gets accepted, you've been taking anti-rejection drugs for the rest of your life. If I used a big consultancy, I'd have to what? Deal with the fact that everyone's saying this is a consultant's change, not our own change. If I use our own people, or just a few faculty members advising, then people will feel ownership of the change. How many of that that factoid about skin grafts helped me understand her point so much better? If you take it a great class at UT, you notice 
faculty members generally throw up really interesting facts, which you walk out of class saying, that was so interesting, I never knew that. Next characteristic I'm presenting, we're going very quickly through these things. You've got to overcome your stage fright. How do you overcome your stage fright? Let me give you two or three ways to overcome your stage fright. Number one, get rid of your rules about speaking. Get rid of your rules about speaking. There are no good rules about public speaking, trust me. I teach this, I wrote books on this before. What you need to do is adapt to the situation and emotionally be comfortable. I give you permission when you give a speech to sit on a table if you're more comfortable. I give you permission to cross your arms if you're more comfortable. I give you permission to put your hands in your pocket as long as you don't play with things in your pockets. <laughs> Understand what mistake we make is we have these very rigid rules about speaking. You must do this, you must do this. Example, trust me, most of you are not that funny. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you're not. We have records on all of you. Right. So never ever start a speech with a joke. So do nothing but embarrass yourself, trust me. Right. Somebody came up a little more time, you're supposed to what? Have a funny opening. That is so stupid. You just want to get to the topic right away. Number two, get rid of your rules, number one. Number two, get less self-conscious. We have discovered one of the biggest reasons people are stage fright is they stop thinking about how they appear to other people. There's probably 450 people in this room. That's 900 plus or minus 10 eyeballs looking at me. If I stop thinking all of you are staring at me, I'm going to get self-conscious, aren't I? I'm going to stop thinking about myself and what you're thinking about me. Instead, what I've got to do is stop looking away at you guys instead. Focusing my attention on you. Who enjoys comedy clubs? Where do you never want to sit at a comedy club? Up front. Therefore, you're sitting up front. I'm not sure why. <laughs> but no, comedians actually know something. When the audience is cold, when no response comes, they always have a set of canned jokes that they can use. And what they do is they pick a few people in front and start using the jokes on them. What happens? Ever in the audience cranes to look at those people being embarrassed. And what's the comedian do? Just relaxing. Is Conan still on TV? What is Andy's purpose in life? I never figured out. All Andy's purpose is when Conan goes cold, he can tease Andy. The camera goes over and looks at Andy as sidekick, and Conan can relax. Ah. You see what happens? Every entertainer has this sidekick they can put attention on when things aren't going well. So many years ago, somebody said, what you want to do is make a hole in the back of the wall and stare at them when you're talking. No, don't do that. Instead, find three or four or five people in the room and say, you're going to be my head nodders. I'm going to talk at you long enough for you to nod yet. When you nod, you have to move over here. <laughs> what am I doing? I'm shifting attention away from myself over to the other person. You also get stage fright when you're doing something novel. So you need to get more experienced. You want to own the room you're going to be talking in. If you go into a room, you're unfamiliar, everything seems weird. If you know the room well, it gets so much easier. You gotta know your material well too. Now you don't want to write a speech up, but you want to know what you're gonna say. Have that point at the beginning and build around it. Let me give you one simple way to sound more effective when you're speaking. Be more organized. Be more organized. If you say there are five things I want to talk about tonight, number one is this, number two is this, number three is this, four or five, you will sound more something automatically. Final thing for tonight, I'm going to be done. Actually, right now we're going to be done. I promise 5.45. I can go on for another half hour or so, all right? Well, let's see. Quick questions. Quick questions about anything. I know some of you have class of six. I don't want to keep you. You can stay a few minutes longer. Those who have classes, please. Everyone's going to fall. If I were an undergraduate, I'd keep you down. All right. All right. Let me give you one last sequence that appears to be leaving. I show a video sometimes. It's from a TV network. It's people giving speeches. I ask people to rate each person on his or her confidence, how confident they appear. So you rate 50 people on their confidence. I then rewind the video, so to speak, and have you rate them over again. I have you rate them on their competency. What's the correlation between your ratings of confidence and confidence? It's almost perfect. If you sound confident, you will be seen to be more confident when you get your speeches. So if you can't really be confident, 
take it really well as the message. But think of every great teacher you've had at school. They're all absolutely confident of what they're talking about. Confidence leads to confidence when you're speaking. All right, that's all. Go away. Thank you.